Um, hello, everyone. Uh, this talk is going to be about one application of XDP, in particular for uh, improving host performance under SimFlood. And we think it's exciting to share because of how much uh, the technology XDP has evolved in the past four years. And uh, we can see now more and more complex applications that use it. And we think the performance results we're seeing from um, doing this particular task, issuing SIM cookies in XDP, um, are quite exciting. So as a high level overview, uh, this talk is gonna start by introducing the problem and uh, what are the opportunities for improvement. We're gonna then dive deep into the uh, exact design and how the different pieces uh, come in together. Uh, we're gonna share the performance results we're seeing and uh, we're gonna close off the talk with uh, some areas for future work and some of the challenges we saw during development. So to begin with, uh, you might recall SimFlood attack exploits the stateful nature of the TCP handshake setup. Um, when an attacker uh, sends a SIM, a SIM packet, uh, the, a host has to keep some form of state because uh, it needs to associate uh, the, this packet with the third uh, packet in the handshake. So if uh, the host keeps that state in memory, uh, an attacker can very quickly exhaust uh, memory on the host and disrupt normal traffic. So a historical mitigation for this issue uh, is called so-called sync cookie, which uh, uh, moves the state from in host memory to the corresponding SYNAC packet. And we effectively uh, pick carefully what the sequence number should be for the, uh, for the SYNAC by encoding the timestamp, uh, a mapping of the maximum segment size or MSS, and a hash over the TCP4 tuple and uh, the timestamp. So the 32 bits um, of the sequence number are going to involve five bits of the timestamp, three bit mapping of the MSS, and a 24 bit hash function. And note that the three bit mapping of the MSS effectively restricts. Uh, it shakes the maximum segment size of connections with sync cookies to eight possible values. This is a technical limitation um, and it's just how it is. And when the third packet in the handshake is received, uh, we can just recompute uh, again what the cookie should be. And as long as the timestamp is recent, typically within a minute or two, we should have, uh, we should be able to verify that there was indeed an initial uh, SIN packet. And this, uh, as we said earlier, uh, means that we don't need to keep in state, uh, in memory state, and uh, we just uh, solve, maybe solve this problem. So when uh, an attacker sends uh, many, many SIM packets, now host just, uh, the host just replies with uh, packets with SIM cookies and everything is good, right? So, uh, we argue that this actually just moves the problem from memory bound to CPU bound because uh, for each SYNAC packet, uh, we need to traverse a very lengthy RX stack. There are many allocations from the driver to the NAP, RPS and RFS layer, uh, then to the TCP IP stack and in reverse when we try to transmit the SYNAC packet, which results in many instructions per SYN uh, per SYNAC. Now, this doesn't mean the performance of the kernel is bad. We just believe that there is an opportunity uh, for improvement by moving specialized uh, the specialized functionality very early in the in the receive stack. And the secondary opportunity we see for improvement here is that the kernel only exposes a global counter, uh, whereas BPF offers uh, many many uh, opportunities, effectively a limitless uh, limitless land for uh, improvement of this. So the rest of the talk is going to focus on how to build this specialized program in BPF. Um, the first piece is a helper function, which is uh, present in Linux after uh, 5.4. The function computes a synco key based, uh, given a socket and the IP and TCP headers. Uh, what we need from them is just the TCP IP4 tuple and the MSS option of the TCP header. This uh, helper is needed because to compute the hash for the sync cookie, we need to use a kernel key, which we don't want to expose to BPF. And the helper works on both XDP and TC, 
just performs some basic verification and then follows the behavior of the syscontrol, TCP sync cookies. So if the value is zero, uh, sync cookies are disabled and this uh, helper is always going to fail. If uh, the value is two, sync cookies are always enabled and we're always going to uh, try to issue sync cookies as long as there's a valid socket. And if the value is one, we're only going to issue sync cookies if the sync queue for the corresponding socket is not overflowing. Uh, the helper is going to pick the MSS, similar to how the kernel is doing that, map it to uh, three bit space and encode it into the sync cookie. And then the return value is going to be a concatenation between the 16 bit, uh, 16 -bit MSS and the 32 bit cookie. And the top, uh, on success, the top 16 bits of the return value should be 0. On failure, we're going to have a sign extended error code. Um, which is going to let us just verify uh, whether or not the helper failed by comparing to zero. Um, the BPF program at a high level is going to try to punt to the kernel as much as possible. Um, there are opportunities for improvement uh, to drop on parsing errors or if the socket fails. Uh, just for simplicity, we're going to assume we punt all of these issues to the kernel for now. So first of all, we're going to try to parse the TCP packet. If the packet is not TCP or is not sent packet, we're going to let the kernel handle it. If we cannot find the socket corresponding to uh, corresponding to the packet, or if the socket is not in the correct state, we're going to pass to the kernel. Here we obviously can drop. Um, if we find a socket, we're going to try to issue a sync cookie. If we cannot issue a sync cookie, uh, we're going to let the kernel handle it. Here we don't know that here we don't have the opportunity to drop a packet because it might be that the sync queue for the socket is not full. So uh, we, in this case, would want the kernel to establish connection uh, with request sockets like it uh, does usually. Uh, if we do issue a sync cookie, we're going to generate uh, the corresponding SYNAC packet in place. We're using the same buffer for, as, the, uh, as the packet for that we received. We're then going to do accounting and then transmit the packet back on the same interface. In terms of uh, the metrics which we can uh, which we can export, know that the kernel only has uh, some simple counters that uh, let us know globally what's going on. But with BPF, we can enhance enhance this by at the very minimum um, adding making these counters be per port, so we know which ports are under attack. Uh, something uh, maybe slightly better is we can detect heavy hitters and see if the SIMFL is coming from any particular host or IP address and uh, filter based on that uh, based on that IP address um, to gain insight into the structure of incoming attacks. We can uh, export information about uh, what the uh, packet size distribution is or what TCP options, IP options uh, the incoming packets use and this can inform us better uh, about making rules to filter incoming traffic and further improve the performance under attack. Now, one caveat here to note is that collection uh, of each of these metrics can be expensive because uh, each of these metrics is more instructions we run per packet. And when you're under attack, we see many, many packets per second. So we do many, many instructions per second uh, for metric collection, whereas we can be doing that for uh, to uh, handle either normal traffic or issue more sync cookies. So the rest of the talk is going to uh, is going to only use per port counters, uh, but we just want to highlight that there's a trade off up for the administrator to decide how much metric uh, metrics they want to export versus how much performance they want to get. In pseudocode, the program uh, is going to look roughly like this. We're going to try to parse the TCP header, and if the parsing fails, whether because this is due to uh, encapsulation that is not supported, or if the packet is not uh, SYNAC, uh, we're going to let the kernel handle it. We're going to look up the socket, try to generate a SYN cookie. If we cannot uh, find a cookie, we're going to release the socket and pass it to the kernel. Then we're going to extract the cookie in the MSS from uh, the return value of the helper function. We're going to do any form of accounting. In our case, this is just increment the per port counters. And then we're going to create in place the uh, back packet, taking into consideration the cookie and MSS. The cookie is used for the sequence number of the packet we send out, and the MSS is used for the TCP option. 
And then we're gonna release the socket and transmit the packet. Here, we can also redirect it to a different interface uh, or uh, rely on some of the batching functionality of XDP. For simplicity, we're just gonna say that we transmit the packet. Um, now, we have improved significantly the performance while under SimFlit because we now we're going to issue, uh, we're going to do significantly less instructions per every uh, single queue issue. However, the reality is that most of the time, uh, each host is not under SimFlit. So we're going to introduce a lot of overhead per packet because we do parsing and then socket lookup, cookie generation. Um, and this adds up, especially if uh, there are many, many sockets on the machine, the socket lookup can be quite expensive. So on average, we've significantly hurt normal traffic, which is exactly the reverse of what we want to do. So to mitigate this problem, we define two modes of operation. We're going to when uh, we're going to define flood mode for when we're under attack. Uh, this, we're going to try to issue sync cookies for every single packet, and to the to mitigate the effect of normal traffic, we're going to sample to determine whether or not we're under flood. So uh, we're going to define a sampling interval T1, which says basically we're going to try to issue a cookie for a packet every T1. Uh, seconds or milliseconds or any other unit of time. If we do successfully issue a SIM cookie, we're going to go under SIMFLED for T2 seconds. Um, and T2 basically defines how many seconds or milliseconds since the last cookie we issued are we going to keep trying and trying and trying to issue SIM cookies. And the two parameters trade off the speed at which we can uh, detect ongoing attacks with um, the overhead on regular traffic. So a high T1 is going to have low impact on regular traffic while we're not under SimFlet, but we might not react uh, as quickly to, to them. Uh, whereas a low one is going to have high overhead on normal traffic, we're going to very quickly detect if we have ongoing attacks. And for the rest of the talk, we use T1 and T2 of one second for the sake of simplicity. But obviously this is a choice that administrators uh, can make. In code, uh, this involves maintaining several global variables. Here we can uh, also just use regular BPF maps. We think global variables are, are as good, but more performant. So that's uh, why we made this choice. Um, we just take a timestamp. Um, if we're under flood mode, so if uh, the flood timer hasn't expired, we're always gonna try to retry. Otherwise, we're in passive mode and we're only going to try a packet if the sampling timer hasn't expired. And uh, we're just going to prepend this skip or sample function to the code we had earlier uh, to inform whether or not we're going to execute the expensive parsing or expensive, um, expensive socket lockup. So going to performance, uh, we, the test we ran involved measuring the maximum sim flood rate the host can handle and then sampling at uh, subjecting the host to different simflids up to that uh, up to that maximum so at 5 10 uh, 20 percent and so on uh, we have around 10 sampling points then we compared at each of these simflid rates the throughput of uh, tcpr flows and we did an a b comparison between these throughputs with and without the bpf program uh, so as you can see on this graph, when we just do a uh, normal, like the regular kernel path, the performance of regular traffic while under SimFlood very quickly degrades as we increase the SimFlood, uh, SimFlood rate. And at around 50% of the maximum rate, we basically are at 20% throughput. And after that, we quickly, de quickly degrade to not being able to establish connections. Whereas when we do use XDP, uh, we do degrade, but we are at about 80% throughput even when we are, are at very, very high simple rates. And note that here we're not CPU bound because CPUs are at around 40% um, at this simple rate and this throughput. We just hit limits on the NIC itself. Uh, so I would like to close off by talking uh, just about some of the challenges and how we can, uh, some of the areas for future work of this project. 
So the first, the first uh, challenge we hit was parsing the TCP options for the incoming packet. Uh, because they have TCP options are going to be inherently a variable offset and they're going to be a variable number of them. It was very hard to convince the BPI verifier that uh, our accesses to options are indeed uh, valid. We jumped around this hoop by uh, just having a switch statement around the number of options. Uh, there's, as, as you saw in the previous slide, this didn't inherently hurt performance too bad, but we can obviously improve it a little bit by, um, by uh, doing something smart in a verifier, um, but we haven't done it as of now. Uh, perhaps a more interesting challenge is not specific to this project itself, but more general to XDP and how to how to handle multi-buffer packets and XDP at the same time. Um, so far, this is kind of an either or, but uh, there's very exciting development um, of stream for having support. For now, um, if we want to use both of these features, uh, we both the BPF program and multi-buffer packets, our option is basically to trade off some performance back and run the program at TC. Um, this is obviously suboptimal, but it allows us to get like uh, to get both functionalities. And last, um, there is uh, there is a very clear area for future work. Um, currently, we only issue sync cookies, but there is another another part to Simplets, which is verifying that the incoming incoming sync cookies are correct. Um, there, there's already, there was already support for this in the kernel uh, before we started this project. Uh, there was a BPF TCP check sync cookie helper added, um, which allows us to actually reject very quickly any packets that have incorrect sync cookies. The challenge here is for normal connections, we are going to have two stages of verification, one in the BPF or XDP program, where we verify the correct, and then we're going to pass it to the kernel to establish a connection and verify it again there, which is overhead that we would like to avoid. And we don't have an answer to this question, how, how do we propagate this information to the TCP stack so that we can avoid the overhead on uh, genuine connections. Yeah, and uh, this is this is my talk, and thanks for listening. Hey, uh, <laughs> thanks, Peter. You actually, we recovered our time, I think. So, uh, okay, there's a, there's a bunch of questions here. I'm going to go over them. Uh, first one is from Tom. I, I know you've, you've been responding on, on the chat, but for the sake of the video, I'm just going to repeat them, and you, you, if you can respond in more detail. Uh, the first one is from Tom. Why, what are the multiple allocations in this lengthy receive stack that you talk about? Uh, don't you just need to allocate an SK buff on the scene? Um, so I, I don't remember the full list right now. Um, what, what I do know is we have the SKB allocation that we need to do. We can avoid that with um, Syngate. And there's also, as far as I remember, several allocations, uh, well, at least one allocation for request socket, and I believe also an allocation for the TX packet, for the SYNAC. Yeah, I think the, I think the state for this uh, uh, RX socket, the, the socket uh, trans, transient state is probably the most expensive, right? Because you have to store um, that state under normal conditions. E, I, I don't know which one is the most expensive, I just know they add up. Um, okay. Next question so, is for Harris. Sorry, Tom, go ahead. So like I said, um, my assumption was that the stack would be doing sync cookies anyway. Assume that, that it was doing sync cookies for all the connections. Then when we pass the packet into the stack, I believe the only allocation would be the SK buff, which granted is, is extremely expensive and, and well worth bypassing. Um, but what I was getting to more, and, and I think this is great work, but the possible extension of this is to figure out how to um, more eliminate that problem. And I had done some work on something called TXDP, where if we observe that there, there's a lot of types of packets that really don't require an SK buff, a, a TCP send 
carries no data. So there's no reason why it shouldn't just be processed uh, directly by the stack. Here, here's the n bytes of send, process it, and then dump the data. So we should be processing these directly instead of SKBuff. But we're also going to see this in PureX and some other cases. Um, so it, it might be it might be an extension of some sort to this sort of work. Thank you. All right, next question is from Johannes. He's asking why you just don't drop the packet if there's no socket when you do the lookup, right? When you have a miss or, or no stats. Uh, no yeah, we can drop the packet. Uh, we just decided to pick between passing to the kernel um, and uh, transmitting the packet. This seemed like a right place to drop the packet. We just wanted to avoid potential interactions with the kernel uh, with some behavior. The simplest, simplest thing to do is to just drop it, I guess. Another one was a comment from David Arhan, mostly. It, it wasn't prefixed with Q, David, prefix next time. BPFK time get an S is expensive. And he's seen this in his high uh, PPS workloads. Uh, and you're using it. Your response? Uh, my response was that um, it, it definitely is expensive. There, as uh, Mathieu suggested, there's cheaper options than that uh, that we can use and are going to be good enough. But we noticed that even for BPFK time get an S, the cost ended up being smaller than the cost for missing a socket lookup. Um, so yeah, which would be the case when we're not under sorry uh, when we're not under a sim flood, we would look up a socket and see that the sim queue is not full. So we're going to do this. Uh, it's not even going to be missed. We're going to find the socket. It's not going to be full, and we're still going to waste that time. Okay. It's not just finding the socket. It's not just looking for a list in the socket, but rather after uh, you have to do extra work after you find it. And then you decide that that wasn't worth pursuing, yeah? Yes. Uh, I remember numbers from like a very synthetic benchmark with uh, BPF prog run. Like the difference was like an order of like several hundred nanoseconds, uh, but that's BPF prog run. So. OK, so you, you don't want to optimize for something that's not lowest hanging fruit, I guess. Uh, next question is from Justin. Uh, do you have a performance comparison with and without the mitigation process? Uh, as you said, the timestamp is not free, but he was just curious how it cancels the benefit or not of having this mitigation. Uh, sorry, I missed the question. Can, can you repeat the question? Uh, just which mitigation are you talking about here? It just the, it, it, if you can go on, on speaker. And... Yeah, uh, actually, um, he was talking about uh, the timestamp to to know if it was under uh, attack or not. So it was switching uh, from one mode to another mode. So I was curious how it, is ben it benefits or not to of having this or not. Uh, I don't. I don't. I definitely don't have, don't have a perf uh, benchmark. We. Uh, I also don't have readily available the results. I just know that it lowered the, uh, like small number of percentages lowered the overhead. But yeah, I don't have the numbers right now in front of me. Okay. Uh, then a suggestion from us here says GFS would be probably better. It's good enough. And your answer yep. is. Okay. Absolutely. So yeah. All right. Ah, uh, question from, uh, I'm sorry if I mispronounced this, Pier Paolo Santucci. Is the code for SimGate open source? Uh, no, it is not. Um, yeah, there is a small amount of code in the self-test that like shows how to issue the sync cookies. But I guess the things that are missing there are parsing the uh, TCP, uh, parsing TCP packet, I guess. I mean, the, the code looked trivial from what you showed in your slides. It doesn't look that complex if you understand the concepts. You know, you need the helpers, the BPF helpers, a little bit of parsing, and that's it, right? I probably yeah, most, uh, most of the, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, most of the code is parsing. Yeah, well, I mean, the over, if I print that code, it's probably less than two pages of C from what I saw. Yeah, it, it's not a lot of code. Right. So um, someone could create an, an equivalent version and open source it. You, you may have your own management interfaces maybe hooked up into it. That's why it's not uh, it's not open source. Uh, yeah, we yeah can't go on. Okay. 
All right, any other questions, anybody? Does do things like the fact that XTP can't do TSO affect you in any way? I mean, this is this this connection setup, but uh, does since you keep track of the sockets, uh, is is that going to be a problem or not? I, I probably not. Just just cross. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it should be a problem um, because it's as you said, it's just the connection setup. After that, okay. we, yeah. After that, you don't handle the socket anymore. It's gone, right? You don't you don't start keeping ref counts to it or. No, I, we okay. have to release it before you, yeah. Okay. All right. Anybody else with questions? Oh, this, I'm sorry. I'm just missing a lot of questions, I guess, here. Okay. Um, well, people maybe raise their hands. David Ahan, you didn't put a queue again. Uh, he says he would like to get uh, local clock exposed as BPF get, get fast NS, half the cost, and still maintaining the same resolution. Uh, and I guess that's not a question. Yeah, I guess that's not a question for me as much as it is for the BPF maintainers. So right, seems right, right. Good. That's true. Uh, and then, and, you know, the counter response from Asia is GFIS wouldn't even need a BPF call. Uh, from Srinivas Narayana, uh, question is, what was the NIC speed for the graph you showed? That's part one. Uh, uh, part one is 10 gigabit, Nick, if I remember correctly. Or it's a 10, eh? It's a 10 or a 2x uh, or a double 20, 10. Yeah. Oh, 20, okay. The other question is, do you see any opportunities to keep the useful throughput high near the maximum throughput? I'm not sure if I followed that. Uh, uh, I think that refers to like the the throughput like rapidly dropping off. I believe this is, uh, we were hitting a NIC limitation rather than limitation of uh, XDP or just like not receiving packets fast enough. What 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 would be the NIC limitation is it? Uh, we didn't investigate the problem uh, thoroughly as probably we should have. Um, but yeah, it, it was an issue of not receiving packets. Okay, so the, the follow off that you showed in your graph was because of some NIC limitation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Monsieur Eric Dumazet says you could you would have to send a reset, which is another 15 nanosecond cost. I don't know to what point that is. I, I think it's response to three of us. Uh, I think that refers to missing a socket, if I remember correctly. Uh, if you want to drop the packet, you, you can't just drop a packet. You have to uh, send a reset in a lot of situations. You, you still have to do that management. At that level, yeah. Reset is a must uh, send I, or ignore it. Yeah. If I understand correctly what Derek was saying, that's what he was referring to. Okay. Uh, the next question here is um, to, 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 to who's asking a question. Okay. Eric is correcting, saying that 15 nanoseconds was for the local stuff, not uh, not for the reset. Uh, is there not out of, okay, so I think this, these are sort of uh, deviations from the questions. Um, anybody wants to ask uh, Peter any question related to the talk, please uh, either raise your hand or chime in or just speak, uh, type your question. Hey, Jamal, I think some of that is just bantering in the chat channel as opposed to questions for him. Yeah, okay. Well, there's a happy hour coming up, so uh, we can we can banter all night long. All right, so thank you, Peter. That was an amazing talk. Um, uh, and I, I'm sure people have got a lot of other ideas here listening. Uh, the SYN cookie uh, in co integration was is the first I've heard of. There's a lot of people trying to do SYN uh, DOS prevention, but you, this is the first I've heard that trick of using SYN cookies.